let's go mm -hmm. ahead and get started. Uh, let me start by saying uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Wynne Phillips, for uh, coming to the oral history program today. It's a great honor to be able to sit with you, and um, I know you have a very busy schedule, so thank you for being here this morning. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Phillips, we'd like to start this morning uh, by asking you about the question of mentorship because it's such an important part of the IPPD program. Um, I'd like to ask you to start with your own uh, undergraduate or graduate uh, career. Um, if you had mentors that really inspired you and, 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 and what you learned from them. Well, certainly in the undergraduate experience in engineering school, in a large engineering school like Virginia Tech where I went to school, um, the faculty, uh, you know them as they teach your classes, but there's not a lot of interaction outside the classroom because of the number versus the faculty. Uh, so unless you're in trouble or unless you win an award, you're kind of part of the masses. On the other hand, I was very active in student organizations and student organizations always have a faculty advisor and that's a very good way to have access to faculty advice in general. But I'd say that in, in the large uh, universities today, mentorship of undergraduates is a difficult problem. Uh, you have leadership by example. They can watch the faculty and how they behave. But private conversations are not too many. And I think that's a missing thing that we provided with the IPD, IPD program here at UF. Uh, and we decided there was a relationship uh, between students' access to mentorship from industry outside as well as faculty inside and some independent leadership of what they did in concert with those mentors. And I think that was a great program. Graduate school, on the other hand, is very different. Uh, you have a very serious relationship with your faculty advisor. Um, and if you choose that person carefully and you believe that that's a good relationship for you, then it's an excellent experience in graduate school. But that's very different than undergraduate school. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that the mentorship in graduate school was probably the reason I wound up being, as my father always said, a student in the university forever. He used to ask me, are you ever going to get a real job? And uh, uh, I assured him that uh, I would continue in the university environment. But I'd say the mentorship of my uh, faculty advisor and advisory committee as a graduate school were probably the leadership that convinced me that you could have a bigger impact on more people by being a faculty member in a university than working individually in industry, and that's what I wanted to do. Can you talk a little bit about your graduate experience and, and your, your advisor and your committee and, and the impact they had on you? Well, I think the, the largest impact uh, they had on me was an appreciation of the academic responsibility of graduate school in producing the faculty of the future and um, the relationship between uh, their knowledge of science and my learning of science. I had a very uh, broad uh, graduate experience at the University of Virginia in a program where I had to uh, experience the opportunity to prove I knew chemistry and physics and engineering all at the same time, as well as applied mathematics. So it was a very torturous uh, process academically, but uh, some great people with great ideas uh, mentored me through that process and convincing me that leadership through faculty and university is a good career. Hmm. Now, we've been interviewing uh, faculty, um, students, alumni in, in IPPD. They love the program. They speak so highly of it. They talk about the impact it's made on them individually, intellectually, professionally. Could you take us back and tell us a story about how IPPD began? Who were kind of the key people? What were the key ideas? <clears throat> well, I came to Florida as Dean of Engineering when Marshall Kreiser was president and Bob Bryan was provost. Uh, they convinced me that Florida was the new opportunity. I was at Purdue University minding my own business uh, in a very large engineering school, running the largest mechanical engineering school in the country at that time. I was head of that. Uh, but when I came to Florida, I noticed that, first of all, as opposed to Purdue, Florida is an incredibly broad, diverse institution. In virtually every program on one campus, students walk in, in uh, concert with everybody from every field you can think of. There's as much social science and, and humanities as there is engineering and technology and physics and chemistry and so forth. 
So in that particular opportunity, I saw a good idea for our students to become leaders, and I thought that would be a good idea. In searching around for how you do that in a large engineering school where you've got a lot of students and never enough faculty to do what you want to do, um, we had an advisory committee of people from industry, and Heinz Friedrich was a prominent person. Uh, he was at the time head of manufacturing for IBM Worldwide, uh, and he spent the time to come to our advisory committee meetings as a very busy man, often flying from somewhere in the universe uh, on a very busy schedule. But he really believed that the students ought to have a relationship with industrial people to understand how they were going to tackle problems when they left the classroom. Um, and so he had a conversation with me about how, and I would say that the IPBD program concept was his idea, uh, that this would be a way to do that. Um, and more than that, of course, as uh, I had learned from experience, when somebody volunteers an idea, you consider that volunteer to lead that idea because you need somebody to do it, and who better to do it than the guy with the idea? So I said, Heinz, we would be willing to entertain this op opportunity if you would lead the program. He said, well, I'm about to retire from IBM, and I will do that. I'm going to move to Jacksonville. I bought a yacht. My wife and I are going to spend a lot of time on our yacht, but I wouldn't mind helping you formulate this program at UF and come down here a couple of days a week, lead it, and so forth and so on. So I said, fine. He said, the only thing I want in return is you rent an apartment I could stay in when I come to Gainesville for two or three days. That's fine. No pay, no nothing. That's all I need. Uh, that was a very valuable prize for that small price. Uh, a brilliant man. <clears throat> so he came, and he spent his time here for a little bit. And after two or three weeks of putting the program together and a month or two of formulating how we were going to do it and select the students and so forth and the faculty willing to participate, he said, came to my office and said, this is the hardest job I've ever had. He said, in industry, <coughs> if I want somebody to do something, I say, this is what we're going to do, folks. They all stand in line and say, yes, sir, and we do that. So the university environment's not exactly that way. <laughs> Everybody has independent ideas, not only of what they ought to do, but what you ought to do and what the program ought to do. So he says, it's very complicated for me to herd this into one coalescing whole, but I will do it. I've never given up on a job before. I'm not giving up on this one. So he tackled the program. He contacted the industry's people, and because of his reputation, they came willingly to participate with him. Uh, he finally rounded up the faculty into having a coalescing idea. And then he came to me and he said, I have another problem. My yacht is languishing. My wife is complaining. I'm spending all of my time here because I like doing this. And I said, we accept. My apologies to the missus and somebody will sail your yacht for you. So uh, he stuck with the program, concept of individual projects, projects that industry needed to solve, uh, bringing new ideas from the students. Because he also pointed out one of the biggest problems in industry is your employees are the same employees over time. The neat thing about university environment is your employees are new people every semester. Here comes some whole new people that haven't a clue what you're telling them to, to do, but once they figure that out, they bring new ideas to the project. One of the biggest, one of the early projects was a Honeywell power supply to go into space. Honeywell came to the table and said uh, to Heinz, you know, we can't solve this problem. We've got a weight and heat problem, and our engineers have been working on it for 10 years. We don't have a solution. It's a big contract. We need a solution. The students solved that problem. They designed a solution for that. And I would say there were many successes of this nature where the students say, why don't you look at it upside down or left wing or right wing or someplace else rather than the way you've been looking at it? Why don't you say to yourself, if I can't solve it that way, why don't I try something different? Which is very easy for students to do, very difficult for industry. So that partnership worked. Uh, with a few projects like that, uh, Heinz had a line of people wanting to participate, mentor our students. Now remember, each team had faculty members, industry people, and a team of students from across the university. Because some of the problems were business problems. Some of the problems were engineering problems. All of them had an engineering component. Some of them had sociological components. So therefore, 
you needed to have. If you were doing something that affected the environment as an engineering solution, then obviously you needed social sciences, people opinion in that business. Uh, so it was a unique opportunity, unique projects, uh, one-offs each time, very time consuming. We had to find a place in the building for the laboratory. We created an open concept where students could walk around and work in groups. The thing that now you read about all the time in industry, 25 years ago, that was a new idea. So I would say we even created a new way of working in project teams. What were some of the other signature projects in those, those early years of the program? Well, I think those are difficult for me to, 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 to remember because remember once Heinz started to run the program, I got out of the way. Right. But there were water reclamation projects. There were um, issues of, we tackle problems like say, okay, Florida is wet and we have many wetlands, but a lot of that water is not available for many uses because of the way it's stored. So how do you have, for example, if you have a project where you're interested in water uh, purifying itself over time, in Florida, that's hard because water moves softly, stays in one place. In the Rocky Mountains, it's easy. It flows down the mountain. By the time it gets to the bottom, it's purified again. So how do you entertain those problems in a Florida environment? That was part of it. How do you deal with the fact that you've got an enormous amount of economic development in Florida, which affects the environment, affects the tourism? How do you balance tourism, agriculture, and manufacturing? One of the things our students learned, and I learned early on in Florida, when you come to Florida, there are always two Floridas. If you want to describe Florida as a great manufacturing state, you can, if you talk about the absolute magnitude of what we do. But on the other hand, if you want to talk about where it ranks in other states, okay, per capita, then you find we're very low because we have a lot of agriculture and we have a lot of tourism. So in Florida, they look at the economies divided by three components. In Indiana, it's divided basically by agriculture and manufacturing. So Florida is very big in everything it does until you divide by the population, which is very large, and therefore you find we fall down. So depending on how you want to do statistics, you can, flow, you can always prove Florida's a major component in any industry you want to name, whether it's microelectronics or whatever. For example, one of our projects was trying to locate uh, chip manufacturing projects in Florida. And read the problems with locating those businesses in Florida are not manpower. There's manpower here. It's not building the plant. That's no problem. But it's water. Chip manufacturing uses more water than almost industry, any industry you can take. And it costs a lot of money then to reclaim that water. So how do you more efficiently reclaim that water so you can actually do chip manufacturing in Florida? Solar panels is another example of that kind of challenge. So many challenges like that Many of them, Florida industry was bringing the unique challenges they had by being a business in Florida and a challenge in Florida, as well as the technological projects. And I'd say that was a great thing. And the students didn't find any problem to be insuperable. They would tackle problems that people normally would say that can't be done and find a way to do it. I, I think it's one of the great success stories in engineering in America. Dr. Phillips, when you think about some of the original goals, and you've done a, a wonderful job talking about those, the, the early vision that, that you and others had for IPPD. When you think about those goals, um, did they change over time? Did you kind of, as you look at the program now after almost 20 years of existence, um, have, I guess to rephrase that, have there been changes over time in terms of the goals based on how the program has, has developed? <clears throat> not, not in terms of the basic goal. The basic goal of working in teams <clears throat> on industry projects uh, that need to be really solved, that are real problems, and therefore do the design and build concept, that's still there, okay? Uh, certainly the social contracts always changes. Social contracts of problems always changes. The rules and regulations of the nation change. Uh, you can do things you can't do many years ago. You can can't do some things you could before. So I would say the emphasis of the boundary conditions on the problem, okay, may have changed because of laws, regulations, population growth, all those kinds of things. But the technological issues haven't changed. Okay, science, science sometimes moves from uh, classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And then there are decades before there are major differences in how you approach problems. But science is uh, a great opportunity that sets the bed for these problems, and that hasn't changed. 
How has IPPD uh, contributed to the College of Engineering? Well, I think <clears throat> when I came to Florida, one of the things historically was true. The University of Florida was the most important university in the state of Florida. Uh, that was a given. Uh, Marshall Kreiser and I and some other people at that time, and I think still today, think that while you contribute a lot to the state of Florida and the citizens of Florida by being a great Florida university, you contribute even more by being a great national and international university. So the idea of my job as, as dean of engineering was to make sure that the College of Engineering wasn't only the greatest engineering school in the state of Florida, but it was one of the greatest engineering schools in the nation and the world, and that we were at the forefront of the solutions of engineering problems. IPPD was a way to do that. It was a way to engage with industry. It was a way to stay grounded in the state of Florida. Most of our industry people came from Florida, but not all. Uh, it was a way to understand the, the uh, boundary conditions that engineers would be working in if they went back to work in the state of Florida, but also in the nation and the world, what those challenges would be. So IPPD brought that kind of notoriety because it was a notable program. Other engineering schools noted that program. Um, and I think it helped make, it increase the reputation of the college. Also, the reputation of the college comes from its graduates. So as the grad, those graduates graduate from this program, and all of them got jobs. I mean, all of them get jobs. Uh, they're ready to work. Um, and they bring a reputation to the College of Engineering as producing somebody ready to work that can solve problems, understands the group concepts, understands the context of scientific and engineering problems being served, solved with society. And I think that increased the reputation of the engineering college tremendously here. If you could say one thing to the IPPD community and to future engineers, what would it be? Seize the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. You know, one of the challenges you have in an engineering school always is the students would say, when I go back to the house with my fraternity brothers, I have to study, and some of them don't. Most of them don't have to study as long as I do. So it's a challenge for my social life. It's a challenge for my, my free time and all that sort of thing. But if you have a program like IPBD, then you understand a lot of those other contexts in which you work, and it makes them fun. And they'll work night and day. So I would say it's an inspirational program uh, that needs to continue it needs to be the focus. It needs to be broadened as much as possible. There are economic constraints. It's not for everybody. Um, it can't be handled everybody. But to the extent that it can, have that concept permeate, permeate the engineering education program here. If you could describe IPPD, the IPPD program in one word, what would that one word be? <clears throat> the one word would be awesome. One word is always hard, awesome, but awesome would be the problem. I mean, it would be the word because you need a word that tells you that it's more than everything else. And it is more than everything else. It's more effort on everybody's part. It's more effort on the faculty's part. It's more effort on industry's part. It's more effort on the student's part. And it's more eureka than anything else we do. So you could use eureka if you don't like awesome. Okay. Why eureka? Simply because the problems that are brought to IPP by industry are normally problems they need to have solved and they haven't figured out how to do it. So you need Eureka because what you say, you can't say, okay, here's the problem, here's the way it's always been done, we'll keep doing more of that. No, it won't work. I need a Eureka. I need a unique idea. I need an explosion of the, of the uh, concept into a new environment, into a new boundary condition into a new way of thinking and maybe applying new science. Mm -hmm. So Eureka is a good one. How does, that, how does that process of Eureka happen? I mean, you've talked really well in, in kind of a very general way, but if you thought, if, you know, if you're thinking over your, the years of your career, um, can you think of like a Eureka moment and how it comes to, to fruition kind of intellectually? Is, is, it, a, is it a collaborative process? Is it something where someone just wakes up and says, ah, I have this idea? Um, well, it depends on the context. Okay, I'm, I think if you, if you try to look at Watson and Crick and, uh, and uh, uh, human genetics and so forth, then it was more of an individual 
project. Okay, but in many engineering projects, you you have you have a base of understanding. The difference between IPVD and the normal classroom is in the normal classroom you say, okay, you've learned chemistry and physics. Here's some problems we're going to apply the chemistry and physics and math to, and here's how we're going to do it. In IPVD, you say you have studied math and chemistry and physics, and you can bring those tools to a problem, and here's a problem. There's a missing step. We didn't say how to do it. Okay, we don't say how to do it. In the mass processing, you've kind of got to say how to do it in the large classroom, teaching chemistry to 3,000 3, kids at a time, or 900 kids, or 300 even. You've kind of got to have a formalism, and you've got to have a packaging of process. In the IPBD program, you say, no, you have basic skills. Here is a problem. Think out of the box. You guys get together, argue about how you would go about this problem, and come to a conclusion yourselves. And that's the, that's the Eureka. In each case, this team comes up with an original solution to the problem. All right. Dr. Phillips, I also um, wanted to ask you some questions. Is I've been talking to, to deans um, and different retired faculty uh, over the past few years about this whole process of the University of Florida really moving <coughs> from just the idea of being a flagship university to being a national and internationally prominent university. And you have played a key role in that area, certainly in your leadership and your, your intellectual mentorship. Could you talk about the process of building a, a top tier engineering school, um, how you did that, um, because it's, it wasn't an easy task. No, but I think you always, you know, there's always, there's a little bit of small denominator problem. I mean, if you, if, if small denominator opportunity, I would say. I mean, if you, if you have a situation that you want to improve, okay. You ask yourself, what are the pieces that kept this from happening before? How come it just didn't uh, genetically happen or organically happen? What, what is it that somebody needs to do to tweak this and move it in a different direction? And so you look at the components of, of a great engineering school, and, and a great engineering school is first quality faculty. So the first thing I did was to be sure, and, I, and the college did, let's just say the college, because it was a WE project. Um, was agree with the president. The president uh, at that time was Marshall Kreiser, and he said, we brought you down here for Purdue because we want an engineering school that's as prominent or more prominent than Purdue. Purdue's been around for a long time, uh, and many of the Midwestern schools grew up post-World War II with a great opportunity. They took thousands of veterans from the war. They were the big schools, that, and they grew from, from uh, one-third the size to increasing by two-thirds size just post-World War II because that's where the students went, and they took a lot of them there. Uh, and they became large, and in that largeness, they also got in the business of doing uh, federal projects. They got in the business of research. They began to look at problems in a difficult way, um, and they hired outstanding faculty that were attracted to that environment. And so in Florida, we decided that we should increase the quality of the faculty, make sure that we hired people who were inspirational to students, who were creative, and who would actually compete in the research agenda in the nation and get grants, which is a peer-reviewed process, to prove that what your ideas are worth the government or industry paying for and solve those problems. So the fun fundamental thing was to, to talk with each of the department chairs and say what we want to do is hire the very best faculty from leading institutions. Not because you can't find an outstanding faculty in a university that's not ranked number one, two, three. But if they've entered the university that's ranked one, two, three, they've lived in that environment. They know what that environment looks like. And when they bring that environment desire with them, they help you create that environment. So hire good people from first quality universities, not because they're necessarily better than somebody from someplace else, but they have lived in an environment and proved that they can succeed in that environment, and they will help you create that environment. The next thing I said is we got to get out of town. I will support you guys to serve on commissions and boards if you need travel money. Whatever you need to do, the dean's office will get you out of town if you have a worthwhile purpose. Because I noticed when I came, when I was at Purdue, the faculty 
wanted to get out of town. You'd like to leave West Lafayette, Indiana for any reason. Summertime, wintertime, it's flat. There are no mountains. There's no water. There's cornfields. It's hot in summer, cold in winter, and you want to get out of town. In Florida, it's a nice environment. People like to stay here. So the fact that you don't go anywhere, they own a boat at Cedar Key, they got a cabin on the beach or something, and so everybody stays in Florida. And I said, that's not where the action is. You got to get out of town. So we can increase the concept of get out of town. Go to these other places. I want you at the leading conferences in the country. I want you walking on the campuses of outstanding engineering schools. I want the people at those outstanding engineering schools to know who you are. Next thing we did was, I said, on your advisory committees, you know, one of the one of the things about an uh, institution is the opinion of people, opinion of your peers. So on your advisory committees, I want people from leading institutions, institutions you aspire to be like. I want those people serving on your advisory committees. Because when they come home, when they go back, they will either tell everybody how lousy you are or how good they are. And they, we hope you're good, and then they will spread that reputation. So you, you bring important people to the table, you hire faculty from environments you want to be like, and then you give them the message that um, the past is not going to be our future. Our future is going to be to compete with the very best. And we're going to work harder than ever before, and we're going to meet these goals. Um, and of course, we address things like we paid low because it was Florida. We, we used to hire, we, we always joke in Florida, you hire on sunshine, right? You don't really have to pay Mary very much because she'd really rather live in Florida than Minnesota. Okay, but on the other hand, if Mary is inspirational and very good, she will not work for less pay just for the environment because she's coming for a vacation. I don't want to hire Mary for a vacation. I want to hire Mary to work. We also increased diversity. We went to hiring women in the engineering college because there weren't very many. And we found out that, um, yes, they can be very successful engineers and that they can sit at the table with the other people and can compete. Uh, so we increased the diversity of the college simply because you increased the pool. Half the people in this nation are women. I don't know if anybody's noticed that or not. In fact, it's about 51%, something like that. And if you don't include them in the pool because you're in engineering school, then you're missing a pool of half the population. It makes no sense at all. Now, you've heard this from presidents of the, of the nation and so forth, but I'm just doing it in this small. Because if you look at Engineering, uh, Betty Vetter, who kept statistics on engineering in America for a long time. I was, as you can see by my resume, I was hyperactive in national organizations for some reason. I like to get out of town. Um, but, but she would always say, you know, you're not going to pass 25% women in engineering, okay? Uh, because the demand of the profession and the continuity of work eliminates too many people's opportunity to raise families as women want to do. So you will always have some women who will not choose to give up that opportunity. And you need to find a way, and we did find a way, to give people that sabbatical leave for pregnancies and things like that. Uh, we introduced that concept. But even so, um, it's difficult to get engineering and its constant demand of a total career path involvement to permeate certain segments of the community. So, but we, we got to our 25% and that's where we wanted to be because that's what it looked like was possible. And we pushed that envelope. Georgia Tech does a little better, but most of the nation you'll find engineering, women in engineering that, that open the door to women engineers still get stuck at about 25%. And I'm not sure how to get past that, but that was a great improvement over 5%. So that's a, that's a bit of the story. I think the reason I tell that story is, again, because I believe in problem solving. And so if you say we want more women in engineering, you've got to go figure out what the problem is. If you don't know what the problem is, then you're just going to say we want more. You're not going to help solve the problem. You need to be part of the solution, and you need to figure out what those boundary conditions are, and then you need to figure out what's possible and get it done. So I think we did all of those things. We opened up this engineering school to a national community, to a diverse community, to a concept of excellence is better, and it's come a very long way. Dr. Phillips, early on you talked about in this process of building a world-class engineering school, you used a very meaningful phrase, and you, you said this was a we project. Right. Uh, who are some of the other we people uh, who you? Well, I think all the department chairs we hired over time um, were in that concept. And uh, we had 
and I think the president of the university and the sequestered president. You'll find all the way to Bernie Matchin, who has lit, literally succeeded now in having UF identified as a preeminent institution as a goal for this institution. Whereas back in the days when Marshall was talking about it and talked about flagship, uh, he got a bit of pushback from the legislature and every other university in the, in the state. Uh, <clears throat> but that concept prevailed, and now I think we've arrived at that concept that let every institution in Florida be as great as it can be. But don't say to somebody, you can't be greater than that simply because you're from Florida. And so I think that concept is there. So I think every president has brought that along. I think Bob Bryan, uh, bless his soul, was around for a, a long time. And uh, he was the person who hired me here. Uh, and he hired a few other people from, I came from University of Virginia at that time. Uh, and I came from Purdue. And I'd been at Penn State. And I'd been in France. And he wanted people with a broader background to come here. And he sought hard to do it. Um, and he talked him into coming here. So I'd say that Bob was a key to that. Each president was a key. I remember when I was uh, uh, looking for the job, when I was, they would talk to me about the job of Dean of Engineering, I turned him down. And Marshall Kreiser called me one day and said, I understand from your secretary you're on your way to Tokyo and you're going to be two hours in the Atlanta airport. Can I come up and buy you a drink? And I said, the president of the university wants to talk to me. That must be something soon. So I said, fine. And he came and I came. And so they pursued the people they wanted in this institution over time that has brought us from wanting to be the flagship to, I think, being there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Phillips, can you talk about, you've already mentioned um, some of the university presidents that you served with. Can you talk about your relationship uh, as a dean to the university president? Because I've been talking to deans from different colleges and each of them describe a unique relationship between their college and kind of and, and Tigard Hall. Can you talk about the relationship that you had as a dean of engineering over time with the university presidents that you served with? Well, I found it to be very good. I mean, I think that the the issue was as long as the president understand understands and buys into the concept that the engineering college is an important concept, uh, component of the institution's service to the state, service to the nation and the world, and its reputation and so forth, and is willing to invest. So um, I had a very good relationship with the president I, in each case. I was able to convince most of them that we needed to build buildings and space for the people we were hiring. We needed to grow the engineering school a bit. Uh, we needed to hire outstanding people and pay reasonably well. So I would say I had good conversations with us. But I think that, that most of the challenge of a dean with the president is also involves the provost. It also involves the other deans as a community of scholars and a community of administrators. And you have to be part of a mutual goal. And if you understand that, and you understand that part of your goal is to help other people as well as yourselves, you're, you're, you have to understand that an individual college can in some ways only be as great as the institution. So my pitch to the president has always been, the engineering college is a part of your mission. It's a part of this institution's mission. It's not on its own. It's, not, it's got its own goals. It's got its own constraints, its own responsibilities. But on the other hand, it needs to be an integral part of what you need to do. And we need to contribute to that part. I think in most cases, leadership is, is much more receptive to people helping them be a part of their the solution to their problems rather than being their problem. And I've always approached that concept that way. Uh, I've always lucky, I guess, because I'm glib of tongue, I could talk a bit if I needed to and come up with a story, so that probably doesn't hurt. Uh, another thing you have to realize, I learned very early on in my career in research because I was in the biomedical business doing artificial heart research and I had to deal with a lot of surgeons. And when we would go to the, the Hershey Medical Center, I was at Penn State at that time, and, and um, we go to the Hershey Medical Center, a lot of my colleagues had trouble working with the surgeons and the doctors. And I said, okay, you know, I believe engineers are problem solvers, so what is the problem? The problem is that a surgeon is a soundbite community. 
He holds life in his hands every day. He's incredibly overworked and busy. He's got more opportunity than he can possibly seize. He's not going to sit around while you try to think about how to define the problem. So your part is to define the problem. His part is to bring the patients to the research project. Your part is to write the research grant. His part is to tell you what the medical need is. You let him sit and talk to you 10 minutes, and you go away and you do six hours work, and that's a fair balance. It always worked for me. I think you look at a university president the same way. A university president has a very few moments to spend with everybody because he's got thousands of people. So the issue is, can you bring in your opportunity, explain it in a, in a New York minute, have it make sense, and get the attention of the problem? And so if you can do that, I think you succeed. If you do like many people do, I remember when I first came here, my secretary would be scheduling meetings, and she would say, well, John wants an hour, and Peter wants an hour. And I said, you know, Kathy, I don't have an hour's worth of conversation for anybody. I'm not worth an hour. Let's start with 15 minutes. And if necessary, if it's a really biggie, we can get to 30. So then the next thing you realize is when people come in with something they really want to tell you, they wait till the last 30 seconds of the minute anyway to tell you. They wind up, they talk about their families, the weather, anything they can to have to f not face the problem. So they're not going to get to the problem until the last 30 seconds anyway. So you really only need a five-minute meeting. And maybe you need another five minutes for explanation. So I think realizing that busy people have busy time constraints is also a way to work with busy people like a university president. And also realize that they are public property. They belong to the, the trustees and the governors and the, and the governor of the state and the people of the state and the students of the university, and the faculty of the university. They have all of those constituents that they have to worry about. And when you present your problem to them or your opportunity to them, Make sure it's not in conflict with them serving as president. That if they solve your problem, they're not meeting their goal of serving as president. So you need to think of packaging your problem in that context. And if you do that, I found it's always successful. Dr. Phillips, you mentioned earlier, it's interesting listening to you talk about the process of becoming the dean of engineering, uh, because it sounds like initially you were hesitant. Um, it was something that you didn't jump initially at, at, at doing. You obviously had a very full research agenda. You were very busy uh, academically, professionally. What was it about that conversation at the airport that changed your mind? I think because the president said, I want to build a great university. And I see you as someone who can help me do that. I think that's it. The reason, the reason though, in terms of, in terms of, of not being interested in the job, I have always found every job, I've been fortunate, every job I've ever had has been so consuming and so much of an opportunity. I never felt like I got finished. So I was never finished ready looking for something else. So I've never been in the context of looking for a new opportunity because every opportunity I've ever had has totally consumed me. And so when some comes along and turbs that, I'm offended and, and bothered because they're wasting my time. They're messing with what I'm trying to get done here and saying, why don't you think about doing something different while I'm up to here and doing what I'm doing? And so I've never found that, you know, running around searching for jobs to be a fun situation. And I've been fortunate enough not to have to do that. And so in general, that was basically it. It wasn't anything about Florida. It was that I was totally consumed in the job I was doing. I had no problems. I was treated reasonably well. I got along with the president, as you say. And um, why should I move out of cold, freezing Indiana with cornfields? But some of the best people in the world, Indiana natives will kill for each other. Um, but my children, on the other hand, said, Dad, anytime you're ready to move, we're ready to go. <laughs> because they said, one thing we're not going to do out of high school, we're not going to Purdue, not because it isn't a great school, because of where it is. So we're going somewhere else. And they did. But it's, it's uh, so in general, you know, but if you're a busy person all the time, you can always find sufficient recreation anywhere. So I never have been constrained by that. But I think the general, and the fair thing to say is, is that I've always considered the job you have that you're being paid for, that people are expecting you to do that has some small leadership component 
you have a responsibility there. And, and leaving that's hard for me. Leaving that's hard. Yeah. And I've been here 25 years. I didn't make it out of here. Yeah. Because this institution is one of the broadest, most diverse, and one of the greatest opportunities of any university in the country. I'm totally convinced of that. I tell everybody I hire to try to hire that. And uh, we don't have everything. we not got everything solved. But we have every opportunity. In today's world, a unifocal education is a limiting concept. The world is a big place out there. You by unifocal, a, you mean? By, by, okay, you study engineering, you don't pay attention to the fact that the world... used to joke, for example, sometimes in the engineering school when I was coming along, we used to joke, we think, well, you know, unfortunately, our colleagues think when you graduate from engineering school, your neighbors are going to be engineers, the community is going to be led by engineers, the banker is going to be an engineer, everybody is going to be an engineer. There are no other people. With, and the truth is, there are other people, and they think very differently, and they behave very differently. And so when a student is educated at the University of Florida, they walk amongst all these people. And I think that's the greatest opportunity. Uh, you know, you're going to deal with lawyers the rest of your life, you might as well meet one in school and figure out where they come from. Uh, so I think that that's the, and, that, and this opportunity has been growth. You know, in the past 10 years, we've built 500,000 square feet of new research space. Well, I was VP for research and chief operating officer. And uh, that's been led by President Matchin, who said, when he became president, we're going to build research space that helped make this a great institution. And we set out to do that, and we did it. So the opportunity, I believe, at Florida, it can be done. And the only limit is our imagination, our will, and our energy. And uh, I think that's why this is a great place to be. Dr. Phillips, I've been amazingly impressed. I've had the privilege to work with um, some of the undergraduates in the College of Engineering through the University Minority Mentor Program. Right. And they, we meet, they describe their projects. Um, I'm not an engineer, and so it's, it's a great education for me. But what's so inspiring is to see undergraduates who, the moment they walk in the door of the College of Engineering and the University of Florida, they get excited. They're excited about research, you know, working on these problems. You know, one student uh, who just graduated was working on a problem. He was building <coughs> a robotic mouse that could solve problems and moving through a maze. And it was part of a project not only here, but also a nationally kind of competitive project, you mm -hmm. know. And I was wondering, how were you able to, I mean, obviously the college existed before you, you arrived, but it's clear that you really were able to inculcate the spirit of research at all levels. Um, how were you able to, to do that? And, and how, what role does a dean play in, in really helping there be a pervasive spirit of, of research at all levels? Well, I think I simply, you, you simply put, make that part of the program. I mean, you, and you hire imaginative people. You know, one of the, one of the challenges of research, uh, just a, a small sidebar on that, many years ago, one of the people who worked for Battelle and some people who worked for Stanford Research Institute and some uh, national labs like Los Alamos and so forth, said, you know the difference between our scientists and the scientists in the university is at about 50 years old, ours are finished. They've used up their ideas. We're trying to find, we've got a movement, administration, whatever. Very few of them remain creative after that. And the university seem to be creative till they're 85. I mean, Seymour's creative. Um, what's the difference? And again, like I said before, if you, if, you, if you get a problem, you sort of figure out what is the problem if you want to solve it. And the difficulty is students bring new ideas to faculty every day. Whereas if you work in a lab, your colleagues are the same one, the same ideas before, here comes a new problem, they think about it the same old way. Engineering students don't, aren't, aren't uh, tied to that. They come in with brand new ideas and so forth, and they create opportunities for faculty. So if you've got faculty who are willing to listen to that, if you've got faculty who are self-confident enough you know, one of the things is self-confidence, because somebody poses you a tough problem, you're supposed to prove you're smart and they are about that. If you're the faculty, right, you're supposed to say to the student, I've got something to add value here because they're paying me to spend time with you. Um, 
And you've got to be confident that you can do that because some of these kids are incredibly bright. And so I think you, inter you, you introduce the concept that faculty are willing to entertain the ideas of students and have them participate in the research program. You also indicate, by the way, that we are going to be a research university and a research college. You also indicate that the state of Florida is not going to pay for that. You're going to have to get grants from outside to do this stuff. And you need every creative input you can have into your day every day from these students so you will have new ideas to propose. I think they buy that concept. How, do you, how did you promote that as a, as a dean in terms of, of encouraging research grants, expanding the research portfolio? You make that part of promotion and tenure criteria big time. And you also make it part to the extent that the state allows you to have, to have um, um, incentive pay, you pay people for it. Mm -hmm. You say, you know, there will be a difference. Because if someone, if someone spends their nights and weekends writing proposals at the last minute and compete in the national marketplace, first of all, they're marketable. If you don't pay them, they'll go somewhere else. Uh, and second, it is worth paying for that difference. And it is an opportunity everybody can participate in. Everybody can participate in. Uh, one of the things I used to do as, as vice president of research is to say, you know, there's a challenge because research on the campus is not all about getting a grant. In some places, there's no way to support research with outside financing. So unfortunately, you're not going to have a lot of money to do it. But it doesn't mean you can't be creative. It doesn't mean you can't do research without money. And I was, always used to say, you know, if somebody gets... $25,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts. We should applaud that as loudly as somebody getting a quarter million dollars in the health center because it's just as difficult and more improbable of an achievement. And so if you, if you take this concept, I, I, I believe that successful leadership concept that seems to work for me, maybe other people have other ideas, is that if you look at the problem you're trying to solve, you understand that human capital is very valuable. You understand that these people have to want to participate if they're going to be useful and great. And you try to inspire that and offer an opportunity for everybody. You'll find that most people seize it. Mm -hmm. So when you present that concept, most people will seize it. Laziness usually comes from boredom and lack of opportunity, not from genetics, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Right. So you have to really provide that as, as, a, as a dean. And in, in, in a sense, you're talking about creating a structure where you reward collaboration, creativity. Yeah, and you don't, you don't stand in the way of that happening. Correct. Yeah. And you use peer pressure. You convince, as best you can, you convince the community of faculty that you need to impose this constraint on your colleagues. You need to say, this is the right thing to do and lead by example. And you'll find most people do that. Dr. Phillips, you mentioned tenure and promotion, and, and each of the, um, the deans or former deans that I've talked with have talked about an era at the university between, we'll say, roughly the mid-50s to present, where sometimes criteria uh, for tenure and promotion has, has stayed the same, or in some cases it's actually changed or, or kind of been modified. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that process within the College of Engineering in terms of tenure and promotion? Did that, did that process, processes change over time? Has it been relatively stable in terms of expertise? Well, I think it changed, it changed when we introduced the idea that, that um, peer success for outside funding is a measure of peer success. Uh, publication of your search that's useful so that information gets out to the world is a part of the success. Uh, Teaching students and caring that you're in an educational institution, by the way, is also part of your job. And that people who do all of those things are going to be working part harder than people who don't. And therefore, it will be part of the promotion tenure con uh, concept, and we will appreciate it. And the faculty bought into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the faculty, in general, in a university, leadership has to convince the faculty uh, that they're part of that decision allow them to be a part, convince them to be a part, whatever works, but somehow or other, they've got to um, buy into the concept to be successful in university. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe that if, when leadership isn't successful at doing that, they've probably got the wrong job. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the old jokes about Napoleon's con problem when he marched into Russia 
is he marched into Russia and then he found out nobody was following. <laughs> it got to be a problem. And he failed. So, so uh, whether that's accurate or not, but, but that happened, whether it's total risk. But, but I do think the problem is, you know, it's the old joke. I, I am their leader. I've got to find out if they're following me or not. And if they're not, you've got a problem. Yeah. Um, but usually, if people, there are lots of trite sayings you can make. You know, people will participate in things they help create. People will, will work harder for things they help create. People will work harder on their ideas than your ideas. So that's another thing is they, you know, so the only concept I had in, in, in engineering has always been, I don't mind if it's your idea, but I want you to have an idea. Yeah. Not having an idea is not acceptable because then I got an idea. <laughs> uh, but that's, right. that's the idea. So yeah. it's, a, and it's a great place to work. I have a son in industry and a, and a son who's head of electrical engineering at Arizona State. And their worlds are very different. And my son, who's in industry, doesn't always appreciate the problems of my son, who's in academia, and vice versa. But they live in two different worlds, and I get a good sample of that every two or three days on the telephone. Because they still believe that telling me their challenges is of some value, not because I tell them what to do about it, because they got somebody to tell them to. Yeah. But it is a very different world. And you, so again, my, my concept there, rambling too much, is that, that leadership has to realize what the job is, just like the faculty member. And the job is to, to, to get this group of people to be excellent, to get these group of people to educate the students, sons and daughters, with the knowledge of tomorrow. And one of the things I always learned many years ago, I went to a retreat with IBM in upstate New York, and Lou Gerstner, who'd become a president of IBM at that time, said, you know, the world has changed, and if IBM doesn't change, we're not going to be leaders. And what's changed is, we used to control information. We used to know something other people didn't know, and therefore we could provide a product they had to buy. Now with the internet, everybody knows everything we know. So how are we going to compete? When, things, when dramatic changes like that take place, the community has to change. Engineering has to change. Everybody has to understand that the competition in the world is going to be dictated by different emphasis, and there are going to be different priorities in order to succeed in that environment. So I think that promotion and tenure is just another one that says, okay, this is the world we live in now. Let's meet that. Leadership in the university is different than leadership in business. This is the job we have to do. And I think if you do that every day, there is more progress than if you don't. How do you judge or think about teaching in the tenure promotion process within a college of engineering? Well, teaching has a implication that there's learning, okay? Uh, a lecture is not teaching. Teaching is an implication that there's learning. It's transfer of information, concepts, and ideas. And that's what it is. And if you can do that, either by engaging the community as they participate in the conversation, and then sometimes delivering information they don't have in a way that's inspirational and interesting to them, I think that's what the teaching business is about. Many years ago, as an undergraduate student, I had, we had a visiting press professor come to, our, to Caltech. And the Virginia Tech was a traditional engineering school. And the professor got up and lectured, and you listened, and then you took tests to see if you could regurgitate what he said and maybe once in a while interpret something. The professor came in from Caltech, which is a difference. You know, Caltech is a permanent institution. He came to class the first day in fluid mechanics, and he said, I'm so-and-so, here's the syllabus, here's what we're going to study, here's the textbook, and here's what we're going to do. Are there any questions? The students had no questions because they weren't used, they were used to being lectured to. So he said, fine, I'll see you next class. Next class he came in, and he said, okay, these are the topics that are going to be on the next test, and this is the reading material for the test. Are there any questions? Nobody had a question. So he left after five minutes. Third time he came, we figured out we better start. We didn't know what the game was, but we had to figure out what the game was or we weren't going to get through this course. I don't know what he was doing, but we better figure that out. And so we, we got together and we started making up questions. We started having questions. We had a dialogue, and from then on, the course sailed along. 
but he wasn't going to stand there and tell you everything he knew and have you write it down and not pay attention or care. He wanted a dialogue. And he got it by a silent threat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the issue. Teach him implies some sort of communication taking place. Okay. Not a noise coming from the front of the classroom impending on your eardrums. Because you have the ability to not pay attention to what your eardrums have coming in. Always. And uh, that's a big issue. And of course, today's world. You know, what are you going to do in a classroom today? Everybody's sitting there on their iPad, their computer, and their iPhone. And I must say, I must say, I'm a dinosaur here. I don't even know how well I would deal with that at the moment. So I haven't been, been teaching lately. I expect to do that again next fall. I'm going to have to figure out. But that's an interesting question to me. Yeah. You know, what's going on here? Is, what is my objective in the classroom? And how do I get that objective done and have learning take place? And I think you have to do that differently than they than you used to. Dr. Phillips, you mentioned uh, Purdue and, and Caltech and other preeminent institutions. When, but when you started as Dean of College of Engineering, who were you looking at in terms of, of peer institutions or other university engineering programs that you wanted to, to either emulate or learn from? Um, and, and has that changed over time in terms of... Well, you know, that's a, <clears throat> that's a difficult question because the only... The only answer I can give is from experience, right? I mean, I don't, I haven't been at every engineering school in the country. I don't intimately know them. I know rankings and ratings, and I know uh, very successful people who graduated from certain institutions and places where notable faculty are there, Nobel Prize winner kind of people, or National Academy kind of people, those kinds of things. You know those are, are programs to implement. But I think, I think you have to design your own program. I mean, I didn't have a model for IPPD. I had Hein Friedrich's brain, luckily, and some ideas from industry, and some of my own, about what we wanted to accomplish. But I would say we didn't copy anything. But I think that, I think that if I were to, to indicate what I was trying to do, I was not trying to copy Purdue. Purdue is a great engineering school. But it was not an engineering school immersed in a large, diverse institution. University of Virginia was a smaller engineering school where I went, and it was immersed in a totally um, more socially dominated institution than an engineering dominated institution. University of Virginia is not an engineering dominated institution. And the engineering students at the University of Virginia, I would say, ha have an opportunity more like the University of Florida. So I would say that my University of Virginia experience was one that meant a lot to me because, not because of the engineering technology per se, but because of the concept of an engineering school immersed in a total community. And that's my concept. That's my concept for Florida. It always has been. Then the concept of how you interact with future employers and industry and so forth, IPPD is an example of that. So I think you chip away at it with each of those concepts. And, in, and along the way, of course, you've got budget and you've got hiring and you've got people's persuasion and stuff like that, and you hope that you can keep the vector in the right direction. But it wanders a little, and, um, and it's not clear that new ideas uh, shouldn't come along. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that's coming along there is online education, all right? And um, the, the, operative, the operative word is online, the goal is education, and one has to be sure that the operation succeeds in the, in the result, which is called education, because online might, not, might just be information transfer. And education is integration of information for some new purpose, in my opinion. So I think that that challenge is coming along. So each, every, and the, the great thing about the American university is that it is allowed to evolve and adapt. And that's why if you look at innovation in the world, it comes from America more than any place else. No matter what other people say, the new ideas have traditionally come out of this concept. We were a melting pot as a country. We created universities as independent institutions that should seek knowledge wherever it led. It was not packaged by the government, constrained by the government, and in most cases not government employees. 
very different than the German education and so forth. And so you found that, that I think the great value in the United States has always been creativity. At least from post-World War II, that's what this nation's been about. It's been creativity for the benefit of the world. Now, the internet comes along and everybody knows what we know. China knows how to make everything we make. One billion of the world's population live in that country. How are we gonna deal with that kind of opportunity and interface and our students who are going to go to work are going to go work in a different environment than they went before because a lot of their, the parts from the electronic part they're working on is going to be made in China. Boeing, when it came along with the new 777 concept, it said, we will integrate parts from all over the world. And the supply chain management became incredible, okay? That meant that all your parts had to be delivered from all these different cultures and nations in a timely manner to build one airplane, all right? And they found out the cultures were different. Many years ago, I, I helped start a company in, in Brazil to make gasoline pumps, okay? And we said, you know, cars are coming in Brazil, big market, you're gonna have lots of needs for gas pumps in Brazil. And the way to do it, of course, to sell Brazil, you gotta have domestic content, so you gotta make them in Brazil. So we set up a factory in Brazil. And we, we learned a new concept. We paid the people on Fridays. They didn't come to work again on Monday because they hadn't spent their money yet. They came back to work when they'd spent their money. So their concept of a job was come to work when you're out of money. Well, that makes it a little hard to run a business, okay? Because we paid the people on Friday and on Monday there's nobody there to run the factory. So we had a very difficult concept. So we had to understand we needed to get a manager that was Brazilian, not somebody that flew down from uh, Indiana to Brazil and tell these people they got to go to work because they don't get that. They go to work when they need the money. Whole new concept. So you, when, you do, when you do the business, you have to do it. And I think the, the, my, my long diatribe there means simply that the American university, the universities in this country have been the purveyors of creativity. They've been innovative faculty. They've created new knowledge and they've educated students who understand that they've got to adapt to solve the problem. I think that's the great strength of this nation and the great strength of the University of Florida. If you were starting- that's more words than I should be allowed to say. That's wonderful, yeah. It, it's, it, and it, it, it brings up um, a question that I've had, you know, thinking about when you were talking about how you started um, uh, IPVD and, and also as Dean of Engineering. Could you do now, if you were starting today, as a dean of, of the College of Engineering, what would be your challenges as opposed to, say, in the 80s? Um, well, I think, I think the challenge is that <clears throat> the, the fundamental, so, some parts of the business model have changed, okay? The business model has changed because you constantly hear on the radio in the morning that education costs too much. Uh, it's always interesting to me because at the University of Florida, it's their BMW and their living expenses that cost a lot more than the tuition, but it's a different kind of uh, model. But, 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 but the, the concept in the country is it costs too much. The concept um, in, uh, in the state of Florida is education should be delivered to more students by the university than we're currently doing. Online is coming along. So looking at how you, how you use technology to leverage learning, not teaching, but learning, um, is one concept that'll have to come along. The, the issue of communication with a student is very different. You know, it's, 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 it's still something I haven't learned to do is to take somebody to dinner and sit there on my iPhone and they sit on their iPhone while we have dinner together. I haven't adopted that concept, but I've noticed that a lot of the students have adopted that concept. Uh, so there's a whole different way of communication. I'm not sure they don't text each other from three feet. Uh, and that's okay, whatever it is. But the classroom concept, the online concept, the whole concept of information, plus, you know, for example, you don't have to haul around Webster's Dic Dictionary. You can go on Wikipedia and get the wrong definition of something if you want to. Um, so, so it, 
those, those things all have to be kept in mind when you ask yourself what your objective is, and that's to educate, to offer a learning experience that will be seized by a broad community of students who are living in a whole different environment outside than they were before. And how we deliver that efficiently and what the, what the, the students and the people are willing to pay for it. There's no question that students in this nation are willing to pay for education, okay? They're being besieged by the media and by parents and so forth about it costing too much. That condition is gonna affect how education is delivered. Uh, but the concept's still the same. We want to educate somebody to the extent that we can, like Plato did, walking in the garden with one student. Well, we can't do that. So how do you take that concept of transformation of information, culture, leadership by example, uh, thinking processes, and so forth. How do you get that in a, in a more mass environment is going to be the biggest challenge out there, while maintaining the idea that hopefully this person who's growing up from the age of 17 to 21, by the way, which also takes place in college, a lot of people don't understand, <laughs> some parents don't understand, we take them off your hands for four years, okay, mom and dad, um, and then you can complain about how we do it. But, uh, but you don't have to do it. So, so how do you do that in these formative stages? of people? I think it's going to be the biggest concept. And if you take something like engineering, which is very non-soundbite, in a very soundbite world, you know, why do I need to listen to you? I can Google that. Okay. And how do, you, how, do you, how do you maintain the concept and the buy-in that does more than what Google said on the screen? to that concept. Uh, I think that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a challenge. The, uh, the uh, capitalistic uh, system that has served this nation very well, uh, may well may well have strained the moral and ethics concept in business. I mean, it used to be the company in the town cared about employing the people as part of their mission. They cared about producing a product that they could be proud of that was useful to the world. It's not clear that we keep that concept as we move toward the ultimate MBA concept of moving as much money from one place to another. And how we continue to convince the public in the engineering business that the power is not in the wall. You know, you, it's, it's not in there. If you want power, there's got to be this stinky power plant somewhere or a non-stinky power plant or something. And you can't just say, we don't want that. You've got to say, how you want it to be because you want this. And I think that concept, at least in the engineering business, has been a bit lost by the public. You know, you can Google that. Power's in the wall. Uh, water comes out of the faucet. Uh, the world is good. And... Uh, I'm not sure how much responsibility I have to take because it's all working just fine. Might be a challenge for us in the future. The world is crowded. Population growth is going to be a problem. You know, can technologies, do we want and can technology solve that problem? My son just came back from, from Shanghai and he said you can't breathe in Shanghai. The good news is the economy is growing where people can buy cars. The bad news is they're polluting the air and they can't breathe. And so that whole, that whole equation has to be solved in almost an international context now, where it used to be you could solve it in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that was okay. Now when you do something in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it's a shot heard around the world. Whether you like it or not, it's a shot heard around the world. And that's, that, that would be the thing that I think is the biggest challenge. And so how do the engineering kids out of the University of Florida get prepared to deal with that while being technically astute they got to know the laws of mechanics and so forth, but also understanding that the context of what they do is going to be very different. And then my grandfather's statement is, hopefully somebody's taking responsibility. Hopefully. You know, it's a, it's a, my first engineering problem, I'll tell you that funny story, you can leave it out of tape, but, but when I, 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 was, born, I was born on a farm, Grade B dairy farm, milking cows, killing hogs, eating pork, you know, very little cash flow. My grandfather has 17 children. 
two wives. One of them died after 12, and he had another child. But anyway, make a long story short, so as a little kid, I was left on the farm and to work, okay? And so my grandfather said, went to me one day, you know, Winfred, there are pigeons in the barn, and pigeons do bad things to the tractors and the everything stored in that barn, so I want you to get rid of the pigeons. So I said, no problem. I went out and took my air rifle, and I shot the pigeons. And I came back, and my grandfather said, okay, now I want you to get a ladder and go up and prepare the holes you shot in the roof. And I would say that was engineering one. The solution was not satisfactory. It was not sufficient because I left behind polluted water, holes in a roof, air pollution in Beijing. It was not sufficient. That's my concept of engineering. Dr. Phillips, we've uh, taken a lot of your time. Yeah, if you love pigeons, I'm sorry about that. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> right. yeah. It's very, <laughs> very evocative. The, um, and I, I know I've taken a lot of your time, just uh, one or two more questions. Yeah. Um, um, I wanted to see if you wouldn't mind talking about your leadership after um, you kind of transition out of your phase of being Dean of College of Engineering to becoming Chief Operating Officer. Well, first, yeah, I was vice president of research first for 10 years. Can you talk about those positions, how they were different than your than being the dean and, and what you feel you accomplished? Um, in, in the well, I think, I think the, the very difference is that your responsibility is the engineering college. When you become vice president of research, your responsibility is a university. And so you learn, you know, that a fine arts college has research concerns as well as a college of engineering that there's a whole different way of supporting research and doing research. There's a whole different reward structure for dealing with those opportunities because, you know, in the, in the engineering school, you get a grant. In physics, you get a grant. Chemistry, you get a grant. In English, you don't get a grant. Maybe once in a while, somebody wins the endowment for the arts which and humanities, which keeps being cut in the budget. It's, it's always amusing to me when they have an argument in the federal budget and they cut the endowment for the humanities and arts, because it's such a tiny little blip. It has no effect on the economy whatsoever, but removes an opportunity from America. It's a stupid concept. And that's because its defense is inadequate. Okay. And so you, you tackle, you, you support the big guys because they got a bigger voice and pick on the little guys because they haven't got a bigger voice. But anyway, it's a long concept. But you learn that. Mm -hmm. You learn that. And you learn that faculty have to be is creative no matter what they're teaching is one, one thing is another. And you understand that promotion of research, support of research is a very different business. You learn that faculty hiring is very different. Mm -hmm. You learn, for example, that everybody talks about it's important to grab PhDs, but fine arts only goes masters of fine arts. So promotion and tenure, masters of fine arts is an achievement just as a PhD in chemistry. So you learn those things and your job is to support those communities if you want a diverse university like the University of Florida. Because if you're in the engineering college, it'd be easy to be at Caltech, okay? Because everything is engineering, essentially, or science. But the University of Florida, it's bigger. So the University of VP Research, you learn that. And then if you become chief operating officer, you learn that 900 buildings on 2,000 square feet of, of campus calculate for me the number of toilets that all have to work. Do you have that number? No. Oh, just, but they're not hiring buildings. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. And you learn that the power doesn't come out of wall and you got a power issue. Yeah. And you learn the electric bill is enormous for this institution. And you learn all those wonderful research and laboratories in engineering are sucking up more electricity, hardly any electricity to use in the fine arts building. Okay. And so it's fair to ask them to bring outside money in to pay that electric bill. You learn those things. Yeah. But you learn that this is an enormous infrastructure to operate on. And most of the people who are walking around are enjoying it. And the state of Florida has trouble providing enough money to support the buildings, repair the buildings, and so forth and so on. It's much easier to get money to build a new building than it is to get money to repair old buildings. Because it's not exciting. But on the other hand, the, the substrate or the, the structure of this institution is enormous supporting the 50,000 students. Think about this community. Also, 
I had responsibility for the police department, okay, for example. And I won't tell you all those stories, because but it just means that this has to be on 24-7. I gave up that job um, April 1st. Now I'm senior advisor to the president. But, but um, you learn that you have a little city here of 80,000 people. And in 80,000 people, you have something happening every day. Something happening every day. Uh, but it gives you an appreciation for the entire cup. So I'm, I, I'm very pleased at that opportunity. The president asked me to do that, and I did. Vice President of Research, though, in my opinion, is the best job at the university. Why? Because the, you, you, your, your responsibility is to make sure that the infrastructure, the culture, the systems all promote creativity on the campus. That's your responsibility in research. Because research is really a word for creativity. I mean, research to, to Los Alamos means energy. Research to somebody else means something else. But research is really creativity and new ideas. And that's the soul of the university. Okay? And that is seeking knowledge wherever it may lead. And I think that's the job of Vice President of Research. I like that job, best job I've ever had. And you get a little bit of money to support people once in a while. And once in a while you can do something and somebody says thank you, as opposed to how come I have to do this. Were there surprises that you had as you moved into becoming Vice President of, of Research or new, new things you had to learn? I think the biggest surprise to me was the an, an appreciation for the tremendous effort the faculty on this, this campus do trying to promote research, to do their research, to get their job done. And uh, there are a lot of people who, who are driven and motivated by that objective, and I appreciated that very much. You know, and, and, I, and I learned to shift gears. You know, I learned to shift gears because, and I call shifting gears because somebody comes in with an issue in fine arts that's five thousand dollars that's probably more important to them than somebody coming in from the health center with a half a billion dollar problem you know or a hundred million dollar problem or a fifty million dollar problem you know those are two the bigger numbers but hundreds of thousands of dollars let's say but i mean simply that the the concept of what people need and can do in order to facilitate that creativity is a very different scale okay and so someone comes in, and, and it's very much like the, the emergency room, right? I mean, if, you, if you're in an emergency room and somebody comes in and lost a leg in an automobile and is bleeding to death, that's something very exciting. And then somebody comes in and they're worried about a wart. And you say, you know, hey, how <laughs> come you're wasting my time? No, they're not. They're prob it's their problem, and that problem is very important to them. And realizing that... that Having an appreciation for people's problems and where they're coming from is, I think, the greatest thing I learned in that job. You talked earlier when you became dean of, of engineering that you tried to change this idea of having, instead of having a one-hour meeting, why not 30 minutes? Maybe you can do it in 15, maybe five. Um, if you had just a few minutes to go before, let's say, the state legislature, or it could be the head of, a, head of industry, and sell them on the concept of why public education is so very important today. What would you say? What would be your, your sound bites? Hmm. Without considering the audience and all that sort of thing, right? What would be the ideal thing to say? Well, I think, I think the issue is that the tradition of public education in America has been the opportunity for upward mobility, okay? Public education, in theory, and largely in concept, allows people, no matter where they come from, what their economic or cultural background is, to better themselves, to, to experience the world. Um, you know, taking my own case, when I went to the university from a farm, I didn't know what a university was. I knew that I should go there, but I didn't know how to do it, okay? Because I had no relatives that ever did it. Couldn't go ask my dad, my mom, what do you do? I asked my guidance counselor in high school or something like that. But it, it, it's a tremendous upward Public education is the upward mobility opportunity because it is offered to everybody. And whether it's community colleges or whether it's universities or whatever, whether it's a local opportunity or an opportunity you go away for, it means that a citizen of this nation 
has an opportunity to work hard for their way upward to a better opportunity in life and to have a better opportunity uh, impact on the world and to be therefore a more useful human being. And I think that's what I would tell them. And public education serves that need. It cannot go away, will not be substituted. One, one of my, you know, I have a private concern about charter schools. I mean, I think, you know, it's a way of buying yourself into isolation from the public conversation. And I don't think we ought to do that. I think we all need to be involved in the public conversation. And I think public education allows that. Dr. Phillips, were there any other um, thoughts that you had that you wanted to share before we, we close? No, I think, you know, we started with the IPBD program. It's a good way to end it. I mean, as I said, the university is, um, its responsibility is creativity, original thought, chasing ideas wherever they may lead. And I think IPPD is a, a way for students to uh, do that and then understand that problems and definitions have different boundary conditions and different utilities. Hmm. And so it's, an, it's a good example of harnessing that creativity as a student. Well, Dr. Wynn Phillips, thank you so much for taking so much time uh, out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate it. Um.